Angels are saying, everything is falling into place for you. Even that one thing you're nervous and anxious about. You are exactly where you need to be. Type Amen to claim it. You made that choice to improve yourself for a reason. Don't go back to habits and situations that weren't helping you evolve. You have to keep reminding yourself why you even decided to move forward. Oftentimes, the final step that's necessary to achieve your goal seems as though it's the hardest to take. You're being guided to push through and keep going. You're almost there, dear child. I love how you pray for something. It seemingly goes unanswered, and then one day you're at the center of the very thing that once felt impossible. The waiting room isn't punishment. God was positioning you to receive the fullness of your request. Stay in position. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Do you know that nothing comes from Satan that is not fascinating? Yes, it's all fascinating. It's like you don't want to take your eyes off of them, and your heart is so attached to it. Yes, that is how Satan can lure us. He will give us many good things, anything that can bring our attention to him, but can drive us away from God. That's why the verse says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There may be an opportunity that we are waiting for for a long time, but if grabbing it could lead us away from Jesus, then it's not from God. We should know that Satan's purpose is to destroy us and steal all the good things that God has given us. He is a thief and a leader. The truth is, he doesn't want us to have an abundant life. That's why he doesn't want us to know Jesus because he knows that Jesus came to give his life and have it to the full, John 10.10. 10. And Satan knows where we are equal. He will offer us exactly what we long for. It will appear fine and amazing. And if we are not aware by studying the Bible, we will find ourselves deceived. Friends, let's not be deceived by Satan. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus alone. Let's guard our hearts for everything we do flows from it. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. A trusted friend or salesperson's gentle recommendation is far more persuasive than a loud sales pitch. And that's not just true in sales. It's true in just about every area of life. The Bible says this over and over again. Proverbs 25:15 says, Gentle speech breaks down rigid defenses. Are you trying to convince a family member or co-worker to do something that they're feeling defensive about? Gentle words, not pushy tactics, will get through their defenses. A different translation of Proverbs 25:15 says it this way, a gentle word can get through to the hard-headed. What does this mean for you? If you're a parent or teacher, screaming at a child never works. Anger and frustration only create fear, resentment, and defensiveness. What does work? Gently disciplining in love. Here's yet another translation of the same verse, Proverbs 25:15. Patience and gentle talk can convince a ruler and overcome any problem. Many of us don't live in cultures with a ruler, but we all have some kind of boss, supervisor, or authority in our lives. This translation reminds us that, with gentleness, we can persuade even those in authority over us. Being pleasant is a mark of maturity. Fools are rude and unpleasant. The wiser and more mature you are, the more pleasant and positive your speech becomes. Remember this, you're never persuasive when you're abrasive. Apart from me, you can do nothing. On days when the tasks before apartheid overwhelming, remember this, I am with you, ready to help. Take a moment to rest in my loving presence. 
whisper, Surely the Lord is in this place. Relax, knowing that you're not meant to be self-sufficient. I designed you to need me and depend on me. So come to me just as you are without shame or pretense. Talk with me about the challenges you face and the inadequacy you feel. Entreat me to show you the way forward. Instead of rushing ahead, take small steps of trust, staying in communication with me. I am the vine. You are one of my branches. As you stay connected to me, my life flows through you, enabling you to bear much fruit. Don't worry about being successful in the eyes of the world. Bearing fruit in my kingdom means doing the good things planned for you long ago. So live close to me ready to do my will, and I will open up the way before you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. John 15, 5, Nazb. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Genesis 28, 16. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28, 29. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Ephesians 2.10 NLT Messages are arriving swiftly, and you'll receive answers that you didn't know you were looking for. Momentum is picking up, and you'll begin to feel movement in the areas you felt stuck. Keep your focus on what you desire to see. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Romans 8.5 Holiness should be our pursuit. Do we know that it's so easy to determine if we are children of God or not? We can see the way we live and where our mind is set. If our mind is set on the things of the flesh, then we are not yet a believer. If what we love most and what we pursue in life are all earthly things, then we should examine ourselves. Likewise, if our mind is set on the things of the Spirit, then we live according to the Spirit. We hunger for the Word of God daily. We acknowledge that we are weak, and so we rely on Jesus. We rely on the Holy Spirit. People's hearts are so deceitful, and we Christian are aware of this. So we don't trust our heart. But if you, always following your hearts, and your pursuit is to be happy even if forsaking holiness, then there is something wrong. You are always justifying yourself and trying to change God's word just to fit into your lifestyle. You still conform to the pattern of this world, and you are loving it. You don't feel any sorrow for disobeying God. You know why? It's because you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. You don't have the Holy Spirit to break your heart whenever you commit sin. You don't have the Holy Spirit who convicts you. It's because you are not yet a child of God. Friends, think about these things. Examine yourself. Believe in the Lord Jesus and repent. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him, 1 John 2, 4. We ought to walk in the same way Jesus walked. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 1 JN 2, 4-6 No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning 
has either seen him or known him. 1 John 3, 6. These verses describe the true believer and false believer. It's so easy to know who the real ones are. As Matthew 7, 40 says, Therefore by their fruits you will know them. So let's examine ourselves. Is obeying God weightier than conforming to the world? Do we feel godly sorrow whenever we sin? Or do we enjoy sinning instead? Friends, let's examine ourselves. Everyone can say he believes in Jesus, but his actions show the opposite. We have to know that a real believer is given a new heart, and if he stays the same as he was, then he's not a real believer. Dearest Father in heaven, I thank you that you do not give up on calling us. Open our ears, Father, so that we can hear you amidst the noise of this world. I pray that each one will see your presence everywhere and acknowledge you. When talking with our families, friends, or strangers, in towns or cities, during our walk in nature or when we see your creations everywhere, when we are hurting or when everything flows smoothly in our lives, when we are sick or healthy, in difficulties and challenges, let us see how big you are, God, in comparison to our daily battles. I pray that in everything we are experiencing, we will always learn a lesson, be prudent, and learn common sense. Thank you, Father, because you speak to us noble things, and from your lips comes only the right words and the truth in every season of our lives. All your words are righteous, and there is nothing twisted and crooked in them. Give us the insight to understand, Father. Give us knowledge. May we choose your instruction and knowledge rather than the riches of this world that are only temporary. And besides, nothing can compare with the wisdom that comes from you. With wisdom that comes from you, we will acquire all that we need in our lives. Father, I pray that we will search for knowledge and wisdom from you to dwell in your holy presence day in and day out. Let us fear you because it is the beginning of wisdom, to shun evil deeds in our lives and idolatry, to always be meek and humble, to utter words that comfort, heals, and saves. Thank you that we can find counsel and sound wisdom from you and your words will help us to defeat our enemies. Thank you for the strength to endure and to continue serving, loving, and reaching others for you. Because you also sent your Son to reach and save the lost. Thank you that you love us who love you and seek you diligently. Riches and honor then will be ours, and enduring wealth and righteousness. Our fruits will be better than anything in this world. Help us, God, to walk in righteousness and the paths of justice. Thank you that you grant inheritance to us who love you. In you, there are never-ending treasures to be found. Thank you, O oh God, that you know each one of us and what we will become before we were born. Thank you for calling us from darkness into the light. Thank you for creating everything for us, the sun and the stars, the universe, this beautiful world, Father, and that you also prepared a place for us with you when our time is up here on earth. In your place where everything is more colorful and beautiful, Father, I pray that each one will listen to you and keep your ways, to hear your instructions and be wise, to seek your presence daily and be guided by you. Thank you that in you there are always blessings and favor, there is life and joy. In you, there is provision for every need that we have in our everyday lives. I pray to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Titus 2.3 ESV Older women are to be reverent in behavior. Why does Paul urge older women to be reverent in behavior? It is because younger women look up to them. 
They have to set an example of how to live a godly life. They have to demonstrate godly character through their actions, speech, and attitudes. They have to inspire younger women to live with dignity, humility, and sincere devotion to God. Being reverent not only benefits those around them, but also for their spiritual growth. In the following verses, Paul continues to instruct Titus, as it is written in verses 3 to 5. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, so that the word of God may not be revealed. At the end of verse 5 it says, that the word of God may not be revealed. So older women, set to be an example to younger women. Don't be slanderous or be engaged in gossip. Practice self-control. Teach young women to be submissive to their own husbands and work at home. Be good examples so that the word of God may not be revealed. This verse holds significance for women today, even young ones. Women, not only older but all women, must strive to be role models. We should inspire and empower others to live with reverence and godly character. Being broke as a man is very degrading and frustrating. To every man who's putting in the work to change his financial status for the better, I hope you win soon, bro. I hope things get better for you real soon. Separated to the Gospel of God, Romans 1.1 our calling is not primarily to be holy men and women, but to be proclaimers of the gospel of God. The one all-important thing is that the gospel of God should be recognized as the abiding reality. Reality is not human goodness, or holiness, or heaven, or hell. It is redemption. The need to perceive this is the most vital need of the Christian worker today. As workers, we have to get used to the revelation that redemption is the only reality. Personal holiness is an effect of redemption, not the cause of it. If we place our faith in human goodness, we will go under when testing comes. Paul did not say that he separated himself, but when it pleased God, who separated me? Galatians 1.15 Paul was not overly interested in his own character. And as long as our eyes are focused on our own personal holiness, we will never even get close to the full reality of redemption. Christian workers fail because they place their desire for their own holiness above their desire to know God. Don't ask me to be confronted with the strong reality of redemption on behalf of the filth of human life surrounding me today. What I want is anything God can do for me to make me more desirable in my own eyes. To talk that way is a sign that the reality of the gospel of God has not begun to touch me. There is no reckless abandon to God in that. God cannot deliver me while my interest is merely in my own character. Paul was not conscious of himself. He was recklessly abandoned, totally surrendered, and separated by God for one purpose, to proclaim the gospel of God. See Romans 9.3. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. When we pray, asking God to sanctify us, are we prepared to measure up to what that really means? We take the word sanctification much too lightly. Are we prepared to pay the cost of sanctification? The cost will be a deep restriction of all our earthly concerns and an extensive cultivation of all our godly concerns. Sanctification means to be intensely focused on God's point of view, it means to secure and to keep all the strength of our body, soul, and spirit for God's purpose alone. Are we really prepared for God to perform in us everything for which He separated us? 
And after he has done his work, are we then prepared to separate ourselves from God just as Jesus did? For their sake I sanctify myself, John 17, 19. The reason some of us have not entered into the experience of sanctifica tion is that we have not realized the meaning of sanctification from God's perspective. Sanctification means being made one with Jesus so that the nature that controlled him will control us. Are we really prepared for what that will cost? It will cost absolutely everything in us which is not of God. Are we prepared to be caught up into the full meaning of Paul's prayer in this verse? Are we prepared to say, Lord, make me a sinner saved by grace, as holy as you can? Jesus prayed that we might be one with him, just as he is one with the Father. See John 17, 21, 23. The resounding evidence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is the unmistakable family likeness to Jesus Christ and the freedom from everything which is not like Him. Are we prepared to set ourselves apart for the Holy Spirit's work in us? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. John 13, 13, 16. To have a master and teacher is not the same thing as being mastered and taught. Having a master and teacher means that there is someone who knows me better than I know myself, who is closer than a friend, and who understands the remotest depths of my heart and is able to satisfy them fully. It means having someone who has made me secure in the knowledge that he has met and solved all the doubts, uncertainties, and problems in my mind. To have a master and teacher is this, and nothing less for one is your teacher, the Christ. Matthew 23, 8 Our Lord never takes measures to make me do what he wants. Sometimes I wish God would master and control me to make me do what he wants but he will not. And at other times I wish he would leave me alone, and he does not. You call me teacher and Lord, but is he? Teacher, master, and Lord have little place in our vocabulary. We prefer the words savior, sanctifier, and healer. The only word that truly describes the experience of being mastered is love. And we know little about love as God reveals it in His Word. The way we use the word obey is proof of this. In the Bible, obedience is based on a relationship between equals. For example, that of a son with his father. Our Lord was not simply God's servant, He was His Son. Though He was a son, yet He learned obedience. Hebrews 5, 8. If we are consciously aware that we are being mastered, that idea itself is proof that we have no master. If that is our attitude toward Jesus, we are far away from having the relationship He wants with us. He wants us in a relationship where He is so easily our master and teacher that we have no conscious awareness of it, a relationship where all we know is that we are His to obey. Beware of refusing to hear the call of God. Everyone who is saved is called to testify to the fact of His salvation. That, however, is not the same as the call to preach, but is merely an illustration which can be used in preaching. In this verse, Paul was referring to the stinging pains produced in him by the compelling force of the call to preach the gospel. Never try to apply what Paul said regarding the call to preach to those souls who are being called to God for salvation. There is nothing easier than getting saved because it is solely God's sovereign work. Look to me and be saved. Isaiah 45, 22. Our Lord never requires the same conditions for discipleship that He requires for salvation. We are condemned to salvation through the cross of Christ. 
but discipleship has an option with it, if anyone. Luke 14, 26. Paul's words have to do with our being made servants of Jesus Christ, and our permission is never asked as to what we will do or where we will go. God makes us as broken bread and poured out wine to please himself. To be separated from the gospel means being able to hear the call of God, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Once someone begins to hear that call, a suffering worthy of the name of Christ is produced. Suddenly, every ambition, every desire of life, and every outlook is completely blotted out and extinguished. Only one thing remains separated from the gospel. Woe be to the soul who tries to head in any other direction once that call has come to him. The Bible Training College exists so that each of you may know whether or not God has a man or woman here who truly cares about proclaim in his gospel and to see if God grips you for this purpose. Beware of competing calls once the call of God grips you. Subscribe our channel to help us reach 30,000 divine subscribers. Donate us super thanks to support us financially. Type Amen to affirm. Thanks for watching.